Night Beat starts right now. After several days of severe weather, flooding, hail, even a tornado, radar fairly quiet tonight. But can we expect any more rain this weekend? Meteorologist Katie Blake will be along shortly to give us an update. It is election night in San Antonio. At last update from the Bexar County Elections Office, which was about 630, more than 45,000 people had turned out amid today's downpour to cast their ballots. And that's on top of the more than 101,000 early voters who made their decisions in the weeks leading up to Election Day. On the ballot, the city's 10 city council seats, as well as the city's mayor and propositions A and B, the latter of which has stirred controversy among voters this year. Some of the votes are still being counted tonight, but we can already project winners in several key races. 13 candidates threw their hats in the ring for San Antonio Mayor. Incumbent Mayor Ron Nuremberg seeking his third term. His biggest challenge in this race also his opponent back in 2019. That's right. Greg Brockhouse is a former District 6 City Council member and took Nuremberg to a runoff two years ago, but ultimately lost by a few percentage points. And then there's Denise Gutierrez Homer, who ran for the District 2 Council seat in 2019 and lost. She touted herself in this race as an outsider with a background in business and teaching. But again, tonight, voters have decided they want to give Mayor Nuremberg another term. Garrett Berger has been following this race. He joins us live from the mayor's watch party at the backyard on Broadway. Garrett, much different than two years ago. Absolutely, Steve. This was a much tamer race than the one we saw between Greg Brockhouse and Ron Nuremberg in 2019, in which Brockhouse forced Nuremberg into a very close runoff race. Now, even though there were a dozen other candidates in this race, the focus was again on these two. But as the early vote totals came in, it was already clear Nuremberg was far ahead, gathering more than twice the number of votes that Brockhouse had at that point. Now, the gap is perhaps not so surprising. Coming into this race, Nuremberg was in a very strong position with strong approval ratings, owing in large part to much higher visibility because of his role in leading the city through the COVID-19 pandemic. And while there's a celebratory mood at his watch party tonight, he plans on getting right back to work, saying the mayor's job, there's no relaxing at any time. There's always work to be done. And in terms of coming out of this pandemic, which has been a historical uh, challenge for this entire country, we're going to have our eye on the ball to ensure that nobody is left behind in that process and that San Antonio truly has the strong recovery that we believe it can. Now, Brockhouse never got the opportunity to really eat into that lead through head-to-head -head debates, which Nuremberg refused to participate in, something Brockhouse said he thinks had an impact in the drastically different outcomes between this race and the one in 2019. Obviously, uh, not being able to debate and have a conversation about things, you know, um, the mayor's strategy was to was to not engage those pe those portions that we had in 2019. It was an effective strategy. I mean, you can't you can't fault the man for running a campaign. I can't run his. I can only run mine. <laughs> now, though emotional during his concession speech, Greg Brockhouse did was also gracious, saying that Nuremberg and Nuremberg's success and that of his family is also the success of the city. And he urged his supporters to pray for Nuremberg and his family tonight. Now live on Broadway, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. It's been the topic of much debate. Proposition B, aimed at repealing the San Antonio Police Department's, the police union's right to collectively bargain with the city. It's something SAPD has been able to do since voters adopted that law back in 1974. Yeah, and essentially the law requires both sides meet at the negotiating table to discuss things such as police officer salaries, benefits, and health care. It also provides the San Antonio Police Officers Association the right to negotiate things like hiring, firing, promotions, and discipline in its labor contract. And tonight it is going down to the wire. Here's the last check that we have. It's been a 51, 49 percentage point uh, against all night since the early voting came out, uh, about 2,000 to 2,600 votes have separated the both, both sides. Our Dylan Collier has been covering Prop B every step of the way. He joins us live from the police union on the city's west side. Dylan? 
And as you mentioned, just 2,000 votes separated the two sides after the early vote totals came in, with the no's ahead by less than two percentage points at that point. We then saw that gap narrow, and then over the last hour or so, widen a couple of different times. This ballot measure is the brainchild of Fix SAPD, a group that was formed less than a year ago, and a group that said it was their mission to hold police officers in San Antonio accountable. This proposition, if passed, would have struck down Chapter 174 of the Local Government Code. That is the rule that allows officers in this city to take part in collective bargaining. San Antonio Police Officers Association President Danny Diaz just a few minutes ago described what that would be like for his officers and why this is such a big deal to his union. They're afraid of losing their ability to take care of their families. And in essence, that's, that's what this, this is about. It's not only uh, defunding, it's, it's abolishment. San Antonio came out to vote. San Antonio came out to speak out and be heard. When we are breaking early voting records, when we are shadow, this is national voting numbers that we're seeing here. And it's because San Antonio is hungry for change. And you could hear O.G. Martin, one of Fix SAPD's founders right there, uh, elated at these results, even though their side has been trailing much of the night and at this point looks like it may go down in defeat. These reform groups feel like they have a voice and that they are able to get their message across to a large group of people in San Antonio, uh, even in defeat, it appears at this point, as we wait on the remaining 20,000 or so votes from today to factor into the tally. Reporting live on the west side, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Dylan. From Prop B to Prop A, currently city charter language restricts bond money to public works, limiting how those dollars can be used. Under Proposition A, that language would be expanded to include any other public purpose not prohibited by the Texas Constitution, putting San Antonio in line with every other major Texas city. But some critics worry it may actually allow too much flexibility as far as how the money is spent. And there you can see the numbers there on your screen. And KSAT has called this race 59% for, 41% against. San Antonio voters, again, are for Prop A. Well, District 2 has seen its share of turnover over the last several years with more appointments and resignations than people elected. Yeah, the last person to get elected to two terms in a row in that district, former Mayor Ivy Taylor. District 2 history is a little complicated. The current council member, Jada Andrew Sullivan, is running to keep her seat, but there are 11 others also vying for this position. Tonight, Jalen McKee Rodriguez leading the race at last check. Courtney 26%, 17% for the incumbent, Jada Andrew Sullivan. Our Courtney Friedman is at Tucker's Cozy Corner on the east side, where McKee Rodriguez is eagerly awaiting the rest of these results. Courtney? Yeah, Stephen Easy's the energy, as you can hear, is extremely high here. A very exciting night for Jalen McKee Rodriguez. At 26 years old, he is the, by far the youngest candidate in this race. And he's actually looking like he's going to be going to a runoff with his old boss, which is the incumbent here in this race, Jada Andrew Sullivan. Mickey Rodriguez used to be the communications director for the current councilwoman. And he says it was that job and that relationship that he built there is what encouraged him to run in the first place. District 2 deserves way more than we've gotten in the past. We deserve to have candidates that we're excited about. We deserve to have, you know, people who are going to fight for working class families, for the people who do not get fought for, people who are going to say no to developer money. Yeah, we caught up with Andrew Sullivan at her watch party tonight as well, just streets away at Smoke Barbecue here downtown, surrounded by a lot of supporters. She was in great spirit, saying she's ready and hopes to continue campaigning for some very specific issues. Economic development, uplifting our district through education of how to actively advocate for themselves, and then making sure that we are bringing in the resources to speak to our youth, to speak to our seniors, and to speak to infrastructure, and making sure that we are in a momentum that is progressing forward. Both of these candidates have very, very similar platforms, talking about almost the exact same issues, showing that there is a strong voice here in District 2 about what they need and what they deserve. Live from the east side, Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News.
Thank you, Courtney. Let's move on to some other big races tonight. Our Myra Arthur joins us now in the studio. Yeah, we're going to turn things over to Myra for District 6 and 7 in those races tonight. Myra. Yeah, good evening. Thank you, guys. It looks like these two city council districts will be welcoming back their incumbents after this election here this evening. Let's start in District 6. Incumbent Melissa Cabello Haverda seeking her second term in the West Side District. First elected in 2019, she was part of a wave of women who won city council seats in that last election. These are the numbers here tonight. She's had a steady lead with 56% all night long. Uh, this one just about to be called, but it looks like she will be uh, going back to take on her second term. Let's move now to District 7. Really the only city council race on the ballot that wasn't so crowded. Just two candidates, incumbent Anna Sandoval finishing up her second term and retired Army veteran Patricia Varela. So let's look at the numbers here tonight. Sandoval leading by the widest margin of any city council district race we have seen tonight. She will go on to win a third term, getting 72% of the vote here this evening. So two familiar faces going back to districts 6 and 7. Today's rainy weather, certainly not what some campaigns were hoping for concerned that put a damper on voter turnout. Let's turn things over to meteorologist Katie Blake for an update. Thank you, Myra. Yes, more heavy flooding rain again today, especially late morning into early afternoon. This after flooding rains last night and that severe weather on Wednesday. I have good news. Things are very quiet out there. We've had a few very light showers moving through tonight, uh, but really we are really winding down our rain chances here and your Sunday tomorrow is looking wonderful and it will live up to its name with plenty of sunshine. We'll talk about that forecast and our next chance of rain. That's a few days out coming up in just a bit. Steve. Chance. A chance to dry things out. Yes. Thank you, Katie. Uh, election night team coverage does not end here. Our dedicated team updating results in races across Bear County. You can find those updates right now on KSAT.com. And we've got more results on San Antonio races coming up after the break. District 1 City Councilman Roberto Trevino did not have as many opponents this race as he did back in 2019. But almost a half dozen candidates stood between him and a final term in office. Last time around, he won easily. He was in a runoff the time before that. Tonight's outcome so far shows he will go into a runoff with candidate Mario Bravo. Joining us tonight from Councilman Trevino's camp north of downtown is Tiffany Huertas. Tiffany? Steve Eces, Roberto Trevino is feeling good about the election results, as you can hear right behind me, and says his team has been working really hard on different projects. Meanwhile, Mario Bravo is thrilled with the results as well, but says people want change. One of the issues both candidates feel strongly about deals with helping the homeless population. Trevino's running for his fourth and final term. Last year, Trevino's office created a homeless outreach program. It brought different agencies together, and they work with homeless individuals to guide them towards services. Meanwhile, Bravo has been one of the candidates going strong in this race. He is a project manager for the Environmental Defense Fund. I think the numbers show that uh, we still have a lot of strong support in our community. Uh, I think the conversation will now really you know, get, be more focused around the work that we've done and, and show the great success that we have seen. People want change. I mean, the, the numbers show that. And, you know, I, I have a track record of being a government reformer. So, you know, I, I think that uh, what I'm talking about is really resonating with the community. Bravo says there are many experienced professionals in our community that do work related to mental health and others are running shelters. He says District 1 needs to do a better job of bringing them all together. Now, Trevino says he will continue focusing on making sure his district understands the work he's done for the last three terms. Reporting in District 1, Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Tiffany. And of course, we will have all the coverage on these runoffs. The runoff date is June 5th. Turning now to our weather. Katie, I'm ready to dry out. I oh. love the rain, <laughs> but I'm ready to dry out. You Today know, was crazy yes. rain at one point. Yes, I, I saw that a lot on social media. People were like, what is going on? <laughs> this is not our typical rain. Yes, we had some torrential rain move through a line of thunderstorms late this morning, early this afternoon. Since then, though, it has been pretty tame and a lot of that water, that rainwater has been able to run off and 
all flood related alerts, advisories, watches, warnings have expired tonight and we will start a drying period tonight into Sunday. Temperatures today 65 in the morning, 71 in the afternoon. We did not move much because of the clouds and the rain and we were just shy of two inches of rain today at the airport in San Antonio. Now if you were with us on the news at six, I asked you if you had rainfall totals from today or this week to email them to us. I say that every now and then, but you guys came through. I got like 35 emails with your rainfall total. So I wanted to show some of those off. These are all since Wednesday. So places like Hallettsville, nearly six and a half inches of rain. Seguin, nine inches of rain. At the airport, more than seven inches of rain since Wednesday. Places like Castroville, more than nine inches of rain. And one of our viewers in Lytle recorded nearly 10 and a half inches of rain since Wednesday. But portions of Bear County really cashed in here. Again, look at some of these rainfall totals going back to Wednesday up near Stone Oak, nine and a quarter, nearly seven inches of rain in Timberwood Park, uh, close to five and a half in Leon Springs. But look out on the far west side, 1604 SeaWorld. It looks like that area was the big winner. And this does verify with our contours here on our radar estimated precip nearly 10 and a half inches there and then 1604 in Shanefield up to 1604 and Braun also close to 10 inches of rain. So these were rainfall reports from you, our viewers, and that is very helpful for us to kind of uh, gauge, no pun intended, how much rain we got over the past few days. So I mentioned flood alerts have expired. The remaining flash flood watch is over near the Houston area where there are still some heavy downpours moving in from the north, uh, but all this is moving, uh, moving in from the south, excuse me, but this is all moving east and away from our area. We do have a swath of rain up north of Fredericksburg. That's really well north of Gillespie County there, and we expect that to move east and not drop down south into our area. Seeing some radar clutter there from our radar site near New Braunfels, but there have been a couple of really light showers moving on through, but any rain out there now is very, very light and certainly nothing like what we've seen over the past couple of days. So here is the setup swirl in the atmosphere here. This is an upper level low that has been uh, sitting overhead pretty much all day. This is going to move east tonight, taking all the heavy rain with it as it does so. We'll see our skies clear out tomorrow afternoon. Plenty of sunshine and a really great end to the weekend. So a quick look at this future cast here, picking up on that rain that's there north of Fredericksburg and a couple of showers here locally. As we head into the overnight hours, I can't rule out again a lone shower here or there, but any rain that falls, Probably going to be closer to a trace of rain if that as we get into dawn tomorrow morning, a few lingering clouds and maybe some patchy fog. That'll be about it. We'll see mostly sunny skies heading into tomorrow. Temperature wise, we're 68 now, some low 70s down to the south. We should be able to drop down low to mid 60s tomorrow morning as skies clear out a little bit of patchy fog possible 87 tomorrow afternoon. Now we do have another chance of rain coming up late Monday into early Tuesday. No severe weather concerns, but we'll talk about that next front coming through early next week in the next half hour, guys. All right, thank you so much, Katie. All right, turning to sports, some familiar names drafted today, Larry. Yeah, three San Antonio area guys. They one went in the second, one went in the third, and one went in the fifth round. We're talking about Kellen Mond, Trayvon Merrick, and Caden Stearns. Plus, the Dallas Cowboys had a specific plan, and they stuck to it. Coming up. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The 2021 NFL Draft is over with, and three San Antonio area guys are going to the next level. Texas and still not great Caden Stearns was drafted in the fifth round, 152nd overall by the Denver Broncos. At his pro day, Stearns said he felt he was the number one safety in the draft, and he was asked if no NFL combine hurt him, and if this is a chip he'll carry on his shoulder going forward. Yeah, I'm not going to look at it in any type of uh, way like that. You know, I'm here where I'm at for a reason, um, and I'm going to show it. So um, there's no there's no problems with that. And as well, again, I'm just going to come in and just work and uh, let, let the rest take care of itself. Smithson Valley alum Trayvon Merrick is now a member of the Las Vegas Raiders. Merrick, who went to TCU, was widely considered the best safety in this year's class by draft experts, and he was expected by many to go in round one. Instead, the Raiders traded up five spots in round two to select him 43rd overall. Trayvon was asked, was he surprised that he didn't go earlier? 
I believe that, you know, that that was going to happen yesterday. Um, but, you know, I didn't let it affect me. Uh, it's a blessing to get, you know, just to be here, um, to get this opportunity and, and to play for the Raiders. I'm just excited to play for the Raiders, man. So, um, you know, slipping in a second is not a big deal. I'm excited. I'm blessed. And one more San Antonio area guy to get drafted was former Texas A&M quarterback and Reagan Rattler, Kellen Mond. With the second pick in the third round, the 66 overall, the Minnesota Vikings grab Mond, one of the top players on the Vikings board per GM Rick Spielman. As a member of the NFC North, he will get to see Packers linebacker and former Reagan quarterback Ty Summers twice a season. Mond has been training for this day for a very long time. My dad always tells stories about um, him, you know, having me throw the ball at the age of two. So, and then my mom, I always told her that I wanted to play in the NFL um, at such a young age. So, I mean, I feel like I've been pre preparing for this for um, the longest time. So, um, like I said, I'm, I'm truly excited. And, you know, um, just having the experience that I have playing in the SEC against, you know, the best competition, um, I think that it's going to make a, a lot easier curve, um, you know, for me than, you know, many other quarterbacks, you know, with the experience that I have. So, I'm not saying that I'm, you know, already ready for the NFL, but I'm definitely going to make every opportunity that I have and um, enjoy every experience and learning experience that I can make. They need help on defense, and that's what the Dallas Cowboys focus on in the 2021 NFL Draft. Eight of their 11 selections play D. Their first six picks were defenders, with their first five selections coming in the first 99 picks. Drafting defenders was part of the plan. Look at uh, you know the results from last year. We just felt like we had a great opportunity. I think it was probably a little long overdue uh, that the board fall right and we were able to pick the uh, the defensive guys. Now, three of the Houston Texans five draft picks play offense with their first pick in the third round at number 67. They drafted Stanford quarterback Davis Mills. And coming up later in sports, the season opener for SAFC, and it was a good one, guys. All right, thank you, Larry. More election results coming up. Our election night coverage continues this half hour. Let's move to District 3, one of the two city council districts which will get a new representative this time around. Current Councilwoman Rebecca Viagran has served her fourth and final term in office. This year, there were 12 candidates to choose from for this South Side district with some familiar names on the ballot. Yeah, and it looks like a Viagran will at least be in the runoff. Her sister, Phyllis Viagran, with 22% of the vote. Tomas Uresti with 15% of the vote. Marcelo Martinez at 12%. But right now, if these numbers hold, it looks like a runoff between Phyllis Viagran and Tomas Uresti. Our Daphne Gray has been covering this race for us. She is at the Embassy Suites on the South Side with more candidate reaction. Daphne? Yes, easy. Tomas Uresti and Phyllis Villagran both held their watch parties right here on the South Side. And both of them telling me with so many people running for District 3 seat, they had to prepare for a runoff election. Now, Phyllis Villagran is hoping to continue carrying the torch as leader of District 3 after her younger sister, Rebecca Villagran, reached her term limits. Phyllis says her biggest issue she'd like to tackle deals with infrastructure and health inequities for the older population. Resti says that his focus will be on vaccinations and getting the economy back started. He says he hopes his experience as a state representative and school board member will urge more to vote for him, while Phyllis says that her experience serving the community and watching her sister serve the South Side will make her a great council member as well. Ma, I am going to bring a fresh perspective. And the other thing is that I am District 3 and I know the needs and I'm going to move forward with that. So just understand that, that that's why I'm, I'm here and I'm doing this is for the community. I've been serving the community now for about 25 years as an elected official. Well, I've got the experience to be able to hit the ground running as soon as we take office. So they know they're going to have experience backing them up. And that's very important to all voters. Both candidates say that what they were prepared to go into a runoff, which is why they say their campaign teams are not done yet with strategizing. Of course, that runoff is set for June the 5th. Live from District 3, Jaffney Gray, case at 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. In District 4, Councilwoman Adriana Rocha Garcia is looking for her second term in office, and she has three opponents, but none of them picking up enough votes tonight to really challenge her for that seat. Yeah, I hear the results so far, and here and uh, Councilwoman Gar uh, Rocha Garcia with 70% of the vote, a huge margin over her closest challengers. Here's her reaction. There is a lot that needs to happen still in District 4. We've started moving on a lot of things. 
COVID put kind of a little bit on a damper in a lot of the plans that I had for the first term. So I'm looking forward to continuing and carrying out the commitments uh, to our residents in the second term. And there are a few city council seats left to go. We're going to hand things back over now to Myra Arthur, who has been keeping track of districts eight and nine. Myra. Good evening once again, guys. One of these districts shaping up really the way a lot of people expected. Another race, though, we are watching down to the wire. Let's start at District 8. Four challengers on the ballot there. Looking to take Councilman Manny Palaez's seat. He easily won his second term in 2019, and he will get a third tonight. You're looking at the numbers here. He's winning with 60% of the vote. And here's how Palaez is reacting to his win tonight. It is a somber win. Um, let's not forget, thousands of people have died during this last year uh, because of a pandemic. Now, perhaps the strongest competition for a sitting city council member is in District 9. Incumbent John Courage facing several challengers, including one making his third attempt at the Northside District seat. Courage beat Patrick Von Dolan by double digits back in 2019, and their matchup may not be ending tonight. We're watching this one for a runoff. Right now, the incumbent John Courage with 45% of the vote. He is not at 50 yet. Patrick Von Dolan trailing him with 38% of the vote. Let's hear some reaction from Courage this evening. I feel very strongly that I've made, uh, I've had good relationships with my opponents. And I know that there's a couple of candidates who kind of agree with me on many things. I think some of them may help me reach out to the, their supporters and encourage them to come on over to our side in the runoff. So still some races to watch tonight. Not all the numbers are in. More results are on the way. Our election night coverage continues after the break. Welcome back. District 5 Councilwoman Shirley Gonzalez's time in City Hall coming to an end. Her fourth and final term. 11 people, some veteran office seekers want to represent people on the near west side. With that number of people in the race, this one could be heading to a runoff. Here's a look. Yeah, the numbers so far indicate that Terry Castillo is currently leading with 30, 31, excuse me, percent of the vote. Her challengers, Rudy Lopez and Anthony Gress, coming in with 15 percent and 11 percent of the vote, respectively. Patty Santos joining us now from City Hall. Patty. Hey guys, uh, it looks like two community activists are headed to this runoff. The historic West Side community, as you said, had 11 candidates, people of very different ages and backgrounds. But Terry Castillo took the lead very early on in this race. She's a substitute teacher and an organizer in healthcare and housing. Now she has invested a lot of money into her campaign, second to Norberto Jeremy Landing. And she'll be facing off against Rudy Lopez, who has deep roots in the community as well. He's been involved with his neighborhood association and sat on several city commissions. They both say their focus is on giving the West Side a voice. Folks are concerned about neighborhood destabilization. So what we need to do is mitigate community displacement by investing in programs that already exist, um, but that will help our neighbors stay in their homes. Top three things that I'll be focusing on is um, senior services, after school programs, and of course infrastructure, uh, COVID relief, is in there too as well. And Councilwoman Shirley Gonzalez is backing up um, Lopez right now. Uh, we, as you mentioned, the numbers are still not in, so we're still keeping an eye on Norberto Jeremy Landing and Anthony Gress. We'll find out what happens tomorrow, but the runoff election will be held June 5th. We'll send it back to you. All right, thank you, Patty. District 10's Clayton Perry also seeking a third term in office. There are four challengers in that race. Yeah, including one that Perry beat in a runoff in 2017. Ezra Johnson, who's back to take another shot. Here's how the voters have that one so far. And you can see 54% of the vote for Clayton Perry. He just needs to get over 50% to avoid a runoff. It appears as if he will be doing that. Here's a reaction from Clayton Perry tonight. I think this is a reaffirmation of my leadership here in the district and on the city council. So I'm ecstatic about this and looking forward to the next two years. Turning now to weather, uh, that rain may have impacted some folks um, out there uh, in terms of voting and the turnout tonight. But I the thought, big question is, are we going to get any more rain? I thought we were going to do the temperatures by candidates there. 
<laughs> for a second, Katie. Oops, that'd be fun. <laughs> or maybe not. No, I or don't maybe know. not. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's y'all's arena. I'll take care of the weather <laughs> stuff. Um, yes, torrential rain today, but the rain over the past few days has been beneficial in many ways, including for the aquifer. We are still in stage two restrictions, so it's up as of this evening, 3.7 feet in the last 24 hours. As of this afternoon, it was up 2.7 feet. So even today it's been rising. So uh, we'll <coughs> continue to see the aquifer level rise. Bless you, EC. It's that mold because of the rain uh, into the day tomorrow. The aquifer recharge zone inside this red line here has gotten some good, good rain over the last few days. So good news for the aquifer and in terms of drought, I'll show you the rainfall over top the drought monitor coming up in a few minutes. Well, another wet day. We have been put through the ringer, haven't we? That's I was sweet. worried. Yeah. I was worried at a certain point today that my car was going to float away. I saw your post. I don't have Twitter. a big car. <laughs> it. I mean, it was bad out there for a couple of hours. Um, it, it was brutal, especially on our trouble spots on the roads. The lower levels of 35. We had some high water there, but thankfully this evening things have been able to run off. That water's been able to get where it needed to go properly. So at the airport today, almost two inches of rain, but since Wednesday, more than seven inches of much needed rain. This time last weekend, I was talking about how on the year so far we were a little more than two inches below average in terms of rainfall. Well, with the past several days now on the year, we're close to 11 inches of rain and that puts us nearly three inches above average in terms of rainfall. So we have done a big 180 here over the past few days. It has been a bit messy at times, but I'm happy to tell you the rest of the weekend will be able to kind of dry off. I keep thinking of the ducks when they hop out of the river and they kind of dry off a little bit. Uh, this is really cool. I, I want to step off so I can show you this. This is the latest drought monitor. The areas of bright red and orange, that's severe and extreme drought. We also have exceptional drought moving into a portion of LaSalle County down near Catula. So I'm going to overlay the precipitation since Wednesday, and you'll see this fill in essentially across the whole viewing area. Now, really the one thing we can complain about if you're in LaSalle County and Catula, I have a few friends on Facebook down there. We really needed it to fill in a bit more here and off into Southern Maverick County. That's really the only thing we can complain about. But elsewhere, places that are in severe and extreme drought got a good soaking the past couple of days. So we'll see this change likely reflected in next week's drought monitor that will be available on Thursday. So we'll have that for you then. So what's coming down the what's coming down the line here in terms of rain chances? Well, tomorrow a good chance to dry off Monday chance of a stray storm in the afternoon. We'll talk about that and then Monday night into Tuesday. Our next frontal boundary moves in and that'll bring us some more isolated showers and a few rumbles of thunder. So a really great day tomorrow. We're going to jump ahead to Monday morning. Monday morning. I think we could see more morning clouds, maybe some patchy drizzle and some fog to start the day, but we'll quickly clear out in the afternoon. Mostly sunny and highs in the low 90s Monday because we've got the dry line that will be moving in from the west. So keep in mind the dry line brings in very dry air that helps to clear us out and helps our temperatures to shoot up. But we can get storms forming along the dry line Monday afternoon. This forecast model doesn't think that happens. In fact, most of our forecast models keep us dry into Monday afternoon because of the cap on the atmosphere. It's kind of it's kind of like a lid and storms have to be able to break through that cap in order to form and grow. But if the cap holds too tight, they can't break through. No storms develop. If storms are able to break the cap Monday afternoon, we could have a handful of strong to severe storms. If the cap holds, no storm development. So this is something we'll be watching closely into Monday afternoon. Now late Monday night into early Tuesday morning front moves in from the north and that'll bring a better chance, kind of a more sure thing of some isolated showers and a few rumbles of thunder. There could be a couple of strong storms here, some heavy rain um, and some flashes of lightning, and this will come early in the day. So it could cause issues with the morning commute on Tuesday, and it may wake you up a little bit earlier than you planned. But this will sweep through first part of the day on Tuesday. By Tuesday afternoon, I expect we'll clear out, and our highs behind that frontal boundary uh, will drop down into the mid 80s. We're going to skip the future casks. We already talked about tomorrow. A little patchy fog possible then plenty of sun in the afternoon. A high around 87. We'll keep you updated on the potential for a stray storm Monday afternoon, but better chance of some showers late Monday night into Tuesday. After that, back half of next week looks really quiet, mostly sunny. 
but warm with highs in the mid to upper 80. So overall, yeah, good chance to dry out here over the next week or so. Perfect. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh -huh. All right, if you're the Spurs, a loss like the one in Boston could stick with you for a while, Larry. Yeah, especially with the younger guys. I mean, this is when the veterans, they really need to step up and help out those younger ones. The Spurs blew a 32-point lead to the Celtics last night. And in soccer, SAFC got a hat trick in their season opener tonight. We got it coming up. keep this as short as possible. The Spurs led by as many as 32 points in the second quarter last night. They were up 31 in the third before the Boston Celtics made a furious comeback to force overtime and knock off the Spurs 143 to 140. Jason Tatum torched the Spurs for career high 60 points. Lonnie Walker the fourth said the Spurs lost their mental focus which opened the door for Boston. You know there was a time where we were up by about 10 points, 10, 15 points and every time they score we we're kind of walking around like we were losing rather than knowing that we were up ahead of the game and um, and just control it. But uh, they, 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 they fought hard, simple as that. Spurs will host the Sixers tomorrow night at 7 at the AT&T Center. Derek White is out and DeJounte Murray is questionable with left knee soreness. San Antonio FC open the regular season tonight at Toyota Field with Colorado Springs switchbacks FC and San Antonio got on the board first in the 16th minute. Nathan gets the ball inside the area, drops it off to Marcus Epps. He shoots, the keeper gets a hand on it and Santiago Patino heads it in for a 1-0 lead. 28th minute, SAFC on the attack. PC with the cross and Patino with a great finish makes it 2-0 SAFC. Your halftime score and San Antonio FC wins 3-0. Patino with the hat trick. What a great way to open the season, guys. Yeah, that's a good that's a good start. Yeah, it is a D, right? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> we'll be right back. Election night drawing to an end, and before we go, we're going to take another look at the results from several key races on the ballot. Yeah, let's start with uh, Prop B here. It is still a tight race. However, those who voted against Prop B still taking the lead here, a difference of about 3,300 votes or so. Yeah, 96% of the vote is in right now, though, so it seems as if time is running out for supporters of Prop B tonight. It was a very close race throughout. Sometimes as little as 2,000 votes were separating the fours and against, but you can see that margin is slowly gained as the evening is gone. There's still votes out there, just not sure there's enough to make the difference up between these two. Then there's Prop A. Currently, city charter language restricts bond money to public works, limiting how those dollars can be used. This means the language will be expanded to include any other public pur purpose not prohibited by the Texas Constitution putting San Antonio in line with every other major Texas city. And then, of course, the race for San Antonio mayor. Incumbent Mayor Ron Nuremberg has swept away with the lead more than 60 percent here, 62 percent. In fact, his top competitor, Greg Brockhaus, already conceded the race earlier tonight. And I have to say, in retrospect, <laughs> uh, I am pleased that the final results seem to kind of reflect what we saw in our bare facts case at San Antonio report earlier. It showed a big margin between Nuremberg and Brockhouse. That came to fruition tonight. It showed that the city was pretty divided on Prop B. That came to fruition tonight. So the question is on Prop B, even though it was a very close vote, what happens now? How do we address accountability and transparency and does that happen with the city contract be interesting to watch for continued coverage and even more results on a slew of races we couldn't fit into one show you can of course head to ksat.com and of course look for continued election coverage tomorrow morning on gmsa Ma max and sarah up early max and sarah and sarah thanks so much for watching good night